Good morning, everybody. I'd like to, to welcome you all here and online as well, too. Thanks for joining us for the uh, 2017 uh, International Stream Daylighting Series. This was kind of a, a collaborative effort between myself, I'm, I'm Daniel Roper, Brian Tanetti with Seven Canyons Trust, and with Stephen Goldsmith. Last year, we had this idea about bringing a, a, a diverse group of, of community members, professionals, together to talk about stream daylighting and, and stream restoration issues. Because we, it was our thought that a lot of times we as professionals or, or community members oftentimes kind of work in our, in our own separate groups. And we wanted to take you know, a, a whole systems approach to these kind of issues that arise in stream restoration and, and uh, stream daylighting, and especially uh, in an urban setting. There is plenty of attention given to wildland stream restoration out there. But we really wanted to focus on those streams that a lot of us interact or, or don't have the, inter, uh, the opportunity to interact with. Really, uh, the Seven Canyons Trust is kind of a, a catalyst for a lot of ideas because it's so local to us. But at a, at a world scale, there's a lot of, of these kinds of projects and ideas happening. So we, we thought it was an opportunity for us to start the conversation and really to provide some you know, positive change. Because too, uh, too often, a lot of these stream issues are looked at as problems, but we're looking at them as opportunities, opportunities to provide for our communities, for all of those involved. Really, our thought was is that we're, we are the caretakers of water, and we have the opportunity now to, to make some really positive changes. With that, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Brian and Seven Canyons Trust. Yeah, thanks so much, Dan. Dan has really been integral in planning this effort, so a big, big thank you to him. I just wanted to quickly, for five or ten minutes, just frame our conversation about stream daylighting, this concept of stream daylighting, in the local here in Salt Lake City. We have a few people on uh, webinars elsewhere, so I say Salt Lake City to sort of frame that as well. So I'd, I'd like to frame it here locally, and then we'll pass it on to Elias Catton in, in Mexico City to talk about a very similar geographical area facing some of the same issues that we face. The Seven Canyons Trust mission is to daylight and rehabilitate uh, the Seven Canyon Creeks of the Wasatch Range, restoring beauty and health to the hydrology of the Salt Lake Valley. It's exciting for us to, to be here at the U and, and have the chance to, to host this, this first international stream daylighting series here at the U because we actually were started in an uh, urban ecology senior capstone course and we have some former students and our professor here today. As students, we were essentially given this idea of daylighting with the goal of creating a visioning document, which we entitled 100 Years of Daylighting ultimately looking at an essentially a century-long vision to, to bring up and restore these, these buried creeks. This plan went on to win a Utah American Planning Association Award, which really sort of spurred the creation of our organization, in that we had this award-winning document, so why not create an organization to then implement that vision? Daylighting is a term to describe the uncovering of buried urban waters, bringing them back to the surface, and restoring their stream channel. And by a quick show of hands, for those of you on the webinar, put up your e-hands. By a quick show of hands, how many of you think that there are less than 10 miles of Buried Creek here in the, in the Salt Lake Valley? I don't see any hands. All right, all right. 10 to 20 miles of Buried Creek. One or two hands. One or two hands. More than 20. I should see all your hands. <laughs> yes, you guys are good, you guys are good. There's approximately 21 miles of Buried Creek here in the valley. Just very quickly, I'd, I'd like to just talk about one of our efforts here locally before we, we move it to Elias. The Three Creeks Confluence is a, in a location where three of Salt Lake City's urban creeks fill into the Jordan. Uh, Red Butte Emigration and Parley's Creeks. We are working with Salt Lake City and the Jordan River Commission to essentially uncover and daylight about 200 feet of this convergence area. This project actually started out in our visioning document, 100 Years of Daylighting, and we presented it to former councilman of District 2, Kyle Lamafa, in 2014. He really, really championed the project, and he got the uh, city departments involved and really elevated the project. We have since finished up, wrapped up the first phase of the project, the community engagement and design phase. 
we held three workshops to basically solicit feedback on three different design concepts, ending in the preferred design, which you see here. We have secured $1.2 million for the second phase of the project, which is implementation, and actually recently just won a Utah American Planning Association award for this project. So we're really excited about this award-winning effort, and we hope to be constructing Fingers crossed, fall 2018. Four years later, hopefully going to see this project on the ground as a demonstration for the potential of daylighting here in Salt Lake City. So cheers to 100 years. And I will hand it back over to Dan to introduce Elias, whom I'm sure you guys are all here to listen to. And then we can get started learning about Mexico City's hydrology. So thank you. Thank you. Really recently, there was a, a really short video clip. This video's only, I think, four minutes long, and it's titled Becoming Midwives. And it's talking about how we as, as citizens can take a new role in, in fostering and caring for our environment around us, in, in taking that role as a midwife to you know, bring health back to our environment. Because I think uh, far too often we think about the environment or that we need to, if we want to enjoy the outdoors, that we need to go out to a wilderness area. But, you know, we forget that it's right here around us. And that if we open our eyes and our hearts, that we can take it in. Elias Catan is, a, is an architect, uh, an artist, a professor, a, a community member who has taken on an incredible project in, in Mexico City of daylighting rivers and streams there. And the biggest uh, of those projects is the, the Rio Piedad, which is really close to his office. So I think that Elias is very inspirational, and I think of the work that he's done, and I think of watching that video as well, too, that Elias is, is taking that on and that whole systems approach. Elias has given lectures and workshops within Mexico City, uh, in Mexico, internationally, webbing a path of mutual vision and vocation, and building our relationships with our ecosystems, not only as a support system and a guide, but a model for a revolution. So with that, I'd like to introduce Elias. My office is at Taller 13, workshop 13. We just set up a, it's like an NGO of NGOs that we call Four to the Cube, or Cuatro al Cubo, which is the other icon within our watershed that you see on the other side. And this is the view that we enjoy a couple of days out of the year, where it's, we, we, could, we get to see our, our mountains, our vol volcanoes, actually. I mean, this, this image for me just represents what we need to be truly in touch with. And, and it's nature, it's our watershed, it's our, it's our mythology, it's where we came from and where we're going. Everything goes around how people relate to place. I always like to start by a big thank you to everybody there, everybody organizing, Daniel and, and Brian, <coughs> and to my dogs and to my parents and to every relationship that holds me up to date, right? Air, water, fire, that's life, right? And, and it's like the big, the big answer to the rhetoric question of what do we want to sustain with sustainability? And it's, it's life. And it's what's the purpose of life? Well, it's, it's life again. For life's own purpose is to be and to maintain a certain balance for it to be. So what is life, right? And then we have like 4.6 billion years ago, a supernova explosion, and I don't know all of the intricacies of this, but there's a consolidation of rock and gases and our planet emerged from this. And very close to this moment, there was a, a, a celestial collision, right? Of a planet sort of the size of Mars, and that created our moon. The moon is basic for this because, you know, a lot of astrophysicists don't, don't see it as Earth. It's the Earth-Moon system. Without the moon, we wouldn't have our axis. It regulates our own biochemical cycles. It regulates the ocean tides. And my office uh, right next door is made out of bamboo. I'm sad you can't see it, but, but if you harvest bamboo in a new moon, you can use it. If you harvest bamboo in a full moon, it just rots because of the entire magnetic pull of this towards, towards the stems, towards the bamboo. So we're in a organism, right? We're in a organism that's been called Gaia by Greek mythology and taken by 
modern astro atmospheric scientist James Lovelock and he developed the Gaia hypothesis which he was a in a big way ridiculed by mainstream science but it's something you know that came in his dreams and he saw he has studies he was doing through the atmospheric compositions of Mars and he realized that Mars is a in equilibrium and equilibrium for a biologist or life scientist it's it's death when something is in equilibrium equilibrium, equilibrium total equilibrium it's 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 out of exchange he said i can save you all this trouble of seeing if there's life on mars there is not you, you can see it because of the highly reactive atmosphere that we have and i don't doubt that there may be some kind of life right but the life as we know it on earth requires this highly reactive oxygen based the nitrogen oxygen atmosphere that is highly complex this is one of my favorite diagrams right it's a uh, the phylo, phylo, phylogenetic uh, map of our species and where we've shared common ancestry and as you can see homo sapiens is a very tiny part of this and it's a web right here we can see perfectly how it's a web of life as Capra, Fritch of Capra mentioned. You see 4.6 billion years of life and evolution is a very complex thing to put in our minds. So here we did a graphic that involves 4.6 billion years in one solar year, 365 days. The formation of the solar system, January 1st, unicellular organisms, March 1st, Photosynthetic algae, March 29th. It's not until 2nd of September that multicellular life emerges, followed by terrestrial fungi. Fish don't emerge until November 22nd. And you, you get the idea. I mean, it's dinosaurs, which we consider prehistory, just happened a week ago. And the revolution is a second ago, rather the industrial revolution. Mexico and the consolidation of the American continent is four million years ago. That's the last day of the year. So life have, has been a long way coming and evolving. And I really recommend this app. It's developed by uh, a professor I, I had the fortune of having in Schumacher College called Stephen Harding. And he, he helped develop Daisy World, which is the mathematical model that ultimately came out to prove the Gaia hypothesis. And here what we do is we walk 4.6 kilometers and we're gaining traction of what happens and we're embodying this. We're, we're having a corporal experience of what this entails. And uh, the dinosaurs are 65 million years, it's just 65 meters ago, <coughs> right? Mesopotamia is half a centimeter. The last ice age is 1.3 centimeters ago. So you see the deep time that life has been evolving and developing on Earth. And, and, and this movement of our tectonic plates and how we see the planet is alive in a, 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 a different time scale that we can also be appreciative of things like plants. But the planet does move and we are part of that movement because tectonic plates require water. And life is very much involved in all the, the processes of water. You see the Himalayas coming up, Mexico closing the gap between North and South America, Central America forming. And you see the fact that stromatolites have been producing oxygen and secreting calcium is is an expression of knowledge. We know how to live here, and what I do here is beneficial for my system, if stromatolites had a person type thing, which is very much what an animate Earth, beautiful book by Stephen Harding, calls to. Life is animate. Everything in life is animate. Even, I, I believe he calls oxygen the passionate Italian. Microorganisms have this way of participating in macro cycles, right? What we really do not understand and a big part of Gaia theory and Earth system science is Lynn Margulis talking about microbiology and its impacts and how this, these coccolithophores 
form carbon shells and then are expelled back into the atmosphere and they help break <coughs> apart minerals within rocks that are an integral part of the Earth's cooling system. Life knows how to cool itself, you know, life, life knows. And we see this yucca in the desert and how their leaves are rounded and geometrically proportioned through golden section to ventilate upwardly and to dissipate water towards its roots so it does not erode the soil. And here we see the Manu, where the Amazon breaks into the Andes and we see one of the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. And life emerges not only as individual organisms, but as a system that is stable, resilient, and regenerative all in one. Life, we can see, has does move around a bit. It is in a balance, it's not the equilibrium, and a dynamic balance at that. We don't go into a very cold climate or a very warm climate or a very dry climate or a very wet climate. We are orbiting around or dancing around what a coherent or, or a life-producing balance can, be, can bring. No one like, like Alex Gray to illustrate what Ilya Prigogan, systems theorist, calls a dissipative structure. And what we can see <coughs> in complex systems is that they come to a point where the dissipative system, the structures complex at that, come to a bifurcation point. This is very much where we believe we are now, in a bifurcation point. A why on the road. And I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan, so how I incorporate this into my own mythology is that we're tending towards Mordor. We are living actually in Mordor. The rivers are toxic, the air is toxic, we can't drink the river, we can't drink our water. And I'm a big fan of the hobbits and of beer and good food. So I believe we should use this bifurcation point to, to really design the systems we want to be at and know how life can evolve through this. Because life evolves through its own laws and proportions and you know we can measure our own selves through the golden section the, uh, our organ that uh, translates sound to electrical signals that our brain can capture is the cochlea it's also a golden section we see it throughout history not only with the greeks we see it in broccoli and if anybody there is fan of tequila or mezcal we see it in the agave the agave and how it grows it's Benka, so it's big leaves, is also golden section. You see, life knows. Life knows how to do it. And termites, we are one of the most accomplished architects that we can see because they build cities that we have nowhere near even accomplished a small proportion of this. They are perfectly oriented towards the sun. So when it's in the it doesn't cool the it doesn't warm the entire city nest. Perfectly oriented with the winds, they do different compartments where one produces a lot of humidity so that they grow their mushrooms and eat through the bark. Or they also are perfectly ventilated where they live and where they are the mass of them so they are not breathing stale air. And they're built out of their own excrement and of their own soil. <coughs> They know where they are, and this is something that I believe we are here to remember, have forgotten in a big way, our place in the system, our place in life. We are also a big part of the galaxy, and how we understand ourselves through this is, I believe, how we can evolve through our current crisis. Ecoliteracy, the center of ecoliteracy in San Francisco, developed by Fritz of Capra, I believe is one of the most synthesized examples of what we need to learn and its basic ecological principles. We are systems within systems. We emulate nature that we behave and exchange through networks. Everything is a cycle, it's non-lineal. Everybody, everything eats and secretes something. We have a metabolism. The question is how that metabolism can be part of a cycle. And ecology is not something to question development. Everything develops, everything grows. A child wants to be an adult and a, a, a plant wants to grow up and be a tree. It's a question of how we develop and how we grow 
in how we are adapting ourselves to the constant dynamic balance that our Gaia Earth system asks of us and how we are <laughs> causing a lot of these changes, so how we adapt to our own consequences. And it's a very big part of becoming systemic. How we understand whole systems is, I believe, the, if deep ecology is one pillar, systems thinking is the other. It's thinking about holes and relationships and networks and mapping, not only because objects, we architects love their objects, and we need to think about places, watersheds and relationships. I do think that as long as you continue looking at things through that old patriarchal Cartesian Atonian lens, you're going to miss out on what the world really is. You, we, all of us, we, we need a new vision of the world and we need a more comprehensive, more inclusive science to support us. There is a new theory emerging now which places all the ecological concepts we've been talking about into one coherent scientific framework. We call it systems theory. The theory of living systems. Living systems? Mm-hmm. All living organisms, as well as social systems and ecosystems. See, this theory would help us get a much firmer grasp on the sciences that deal with life. Are these all your own ideas, or do other people share them? I, I mean, has this been applied in the sciences anywhere? Am I a crank? <laughs> it's okay, Senator. This is real science. And many scientists, including some Nobel laureates, have been working on these ideas. Prigozhin. Bateson, Maturana, just to mention a few. Yes, it is science, but of a new kind. Instead of concentrating on basic building blocks, the system's view concentrates on principles of organization. Instead of cutting things to pieces, it looks at the living system as a whole. How can you think usefully about things in this holistic way? That's what I don't see. Uh, you can contemplate them, you can look at them, as Thomas says. But if you want to do something, if you want to get into specifics, by definition, don't you have to take things apart? Uh, how can you talk usefully about a tree without talking about its roots or its leaves or its bark? Well, I could, <laughs> without even naming the parts you mentioned. A well, Cartesian would look at a tree and conceptually take it to pieces. But then he would never really understand the nature of the tree. A systems thinker would look at a tree and see the seasonal exchange between tree and earth, earth and sky. Would see the annual cycle, which really is one big breath the earth takes through its forests, providing us with oxygen. A breath of life, linking the earth with the sky and us with the universe. A systems thinker would look at the tree and see the life of the tree only in relation to the life of the whole forest. Would see the tree as a habitat for birds, a home for insects. But if you look at a tree and and try to understand it as something separate, you will be bewildered by the millions of fruits it's producing in its lifetime. Because only one or two trees will grow from those fruits. Though if you look at the tree and see it as a member of a larger living system, that abundance of fruits will make sense. Because hundreds upon hundreds of Forest animals and birds will survive because of them. Interdependence. And the tree cannot survive on its own either. To draw water from the ground, it needs the fungus that grows at the tip of each root. And the fungus needs the root to survive, and the root needs the fungus. If one dies, the other dies. And there are millions of 
Relationships like this in our world, each depending on each other for life. The system's theory recognizes this web of relationships as the essence of all living things. Only the uninformed would call such a notion naive or romantic. Because this dependency we all share is a scientific fact. A web of relationships. Yes. But this time it is the web of life itself. The theory of living systems actually provides you with an outline of an answer to that eternal question, what is life? Okay, so this is a movie I deeply recommend you watch. It's in YouTube, and uh, it's a conversation between a, politic, a, a politician, an artist, and uh, she's the scientist talking through Fridjof Skapra uh, design script. And you see, deep ecology provides also with this virtuous cycle, because out of deep experiences like watching the stars out in the Veracruz, Filobobos River, laying, we had a few mezcals, but we were laying, watching the stars, and my friend turns, uh, turns around and says, do you realize we're not watching up, but we're watching out? And that we're going like 70,000 miles an hour, we're up that way? It's like, and it's those Gaia moments, as Stefan refers to them, those cosmic moments when you realize you're small and insignificant but it's beautiful either way and that takes you to swim in the river and really question what you're doing with or what i was doing right with architecture and design and development and it takes me to a commitment saying i'm going to develop ecological design and harvest rainwater and all of that but all of that takes you to other deep experiences like water treatment plants and buildings that fail or realizing that people don't treat them correctly and that's why they fail. So we need to take the conversation to another level and saying it's about rivers, it's about cities and developing projects for that and those experiences take you to other questionings and other commitments and other experiences. And it's ultimately realizing about the beauty of, of, of life that makes you fall in love with it. Right? And if, if we're not providing with those Gaia moments or cosmic moments, we are um, trying to convince people through numbers or through other points of things, which Donella Meadows mentions, the highest place to intervene a system is through the mind and through the consciousness of that. And we know how to inhabit the planet in a very beautiful way. We've, people have done this, civilizations have done that the world over. from from the Incas down to Peru, which I believe are the world's best architects, my favorite at least. And it just seems like from the same perspective that the Andes were carved, the entire Inca city emerges or the other way around. It's just the same, the same appreciation for life. The same adaptation to this provides with laboratories to cultivate more than a hundred types of potato or if you eat the, the corn from Peru, you have, you take a piece of corn, like with both your fingers, they're huge. Connected by more than 25 miles of cities, water still flows through these cities. And cities are connected through equinoxes and solstices to be part of a larger cosmic dance, but also in a very practical way of aligning one city with the next. How do I get to Machu Picchu? Walk towards the solstice. How do I get to Sakskaiwaman? It's that's the equinox direction, right? And it helps you understand how our planet, how our planet system participates in its relationship with the sun. And the rest of the stars, we can go through the Americas with this. The Maya and their alignment with the Pleiades and how Kukulkan, the feathered serpent, goes down, Chichen Itza. Or the Egyptians and how the pyramids point and the passages within the pyramids point to different parts of the stars and different points in time. The Anasazi, and now they take to practicality, materialization of how, how above, how is above is also below. 
the precision about how these civilizations knew how to participate in building their environment is truly astonishing. And I invite you to read 1491. It's a book by Charles C. Mann. He has a second book called 1493. And it's basically telling us how the Americas were inhabited, how there are people participating in building ecological architecture, bioclimatic design like this in the Amazon, and how we believe the Amazon is close to over 40% cultivated by Amazonian tribes. The terra petra and high uh, nutrient content of the soil is done by a pottery <clears throat> buried within the soil, and they themselves buried them in bigger pottery to be part of this. Uh, well, they saw themselves as part of this continuous cycle. And our current condition is very in division of what is natural and what is natural with a little n, as Ken Wilber calls it. We, we are natural. The, the, the most toxic chemical in the universe is natural. Everything is natural. Humanity is natural. And if we see ourselves as part of the system, we are in better ability to be in a regenerative system that produces better health for the entire system, us included. This is an image of the how the forests were managed by Native Northern Native Native Americans, where they burnt what we in Mexico called maleza. The lower part of the image is burnt through controlled fires, putting carbon back into the soil, <coughs> giving a lot of nutrients for their mycorrhizal and fungi communities, helping the soil, helping the rest of the forest. And here we can see how the Chimu in a pre-Inca civilization called Chan Chan. This seems like it's designed by Norman Foster, right? But it's <coughs> in around the 13, 1400s and they're emulating, they're mimicking their own fish nets, providing with bioclimatic architecture, highly efficient material use, and a very beautiful, beautiful landscape that is mimicking their own. So how we design and how we participate in these designs comes out of our intention, how, how, comes out of what we want to come out of this. And be it that there are two big pillars that I see in participating in this whole system design, it's deep ecology and living systems. But there's a series of different tools, methodologies and disciplines that should be applied depending on the design challenge, depending on the situation. The three main ones that I use in my practice is regeneration, biomimicry, and permaculture, which they're all, again, I believe, part of the same story. We've toyed around with a lot of different designs from architecture to doghouse homes and interior design and urbanism Learning from life has always proved to be a success and better off. You see, the hexagon is the best way to occupy space. Plants themselves have hexagonal cells. <clears throat> so in toying around with modular green roofing, we toyed around with the hexagon and found out that it's 20% lighter and cheaper to produce than a rectangular one. And how does this participate within the system of the materials it's made, where it's grown, how it's processed, and ultimately how it's delivered. Life also has inspired how we have done buildings. And this is a, a, a construction document by our engineer. You see, engineers at one point may, may be hard to convince, but once they understand the value of whole system design and learning from nature, they have been the most enthusiastic people to participate with. This is a structural section, and it goes down in golden section, and by area and quantity, as the structure goes up the building. And the building has entailed a number of different contributions, like materials we've chosen, bioclimatic design, thermosolar water, but the treatment, the water treatment failed. In neighborhood meetings, in uh, community, not neighborhood, um, building meetings, people were like, it's, 
because their, their water system had uh, collapsed. The, the treatment did not, was not working and they blamed us. And we looked into the plant and found out that they weren't treating their water plant in the right way. They were dropping tampons, paint and condoms into this and that killed the bacteria. And in meetings, trying to help them come along in this and change their ways, they're like, it's my bathroom. And I throw whatever, the one, whatever I want into my bathroom. Very similar to this moment, that's when we started to shift scale and to work on more urban projects because it's two years invested in this for seven apartments, where in reality, this is a culture that needs to change and not only the tool the culture needs to use. Design is something I deeply, deeply enjoy. It's what I love to do most. And right now, it's, it's a question of more lobbying right? It's a question of more, maybe just imagining. Like this design we did for a client in Israel that he comes out of the arm industry and wants to do a, a peace center, a place where people can learn art and ecology from different backgrounds so that they, because he, this is where we share a deep philosophy coming. I met him at Burning Man and through a network called Hatch. So this is a Because of Hatch project because it's where people want to create a better world. We realize, I think it's a very common thread that we realize that this is, is very much entwined with art and learning, with ecology and whatever passion you have inside of you to come manifest and how we can join things together and do things together as communities, not only as individuals, but in having a shared learning experience we believe is what can provide the most transformational change. The building has a number of different uh, aspirations for ecological performance and its integration to the land. It's basically just, our concept here was like, if, if aliens kidnapped an Inca, what would happen? <laughs> And we worked on this project with a dear friend that is a uh, Mark Gurner, and he's a con concept artist that's worked in movies. Since, since we came to the idea of this concept, because we're, how is a place where Palestinians and Israelis can, can live together and learn together? And this place is the future, right? This place is like out of fantasy. And this is also where I believe we need to stretch our imagination to envision a better possibility. And any <coughs> old stupid idea of building walls to segregate people instead of joining them should be fought with proposals, with, with a coherent resistance that has a proposal that could ultimately make sense. Why do we divide when we could hyperconnect? Why are we abandoning our watersheds when in fact it's what we should be doing as a co-nation? So we developed this Otra Nation, which was an official submission for the, to the White House, along with a series of Mexican, American, and even French designers. So how do we knit our own practices, our own dynamics with our place? How can we be a part of our place and have a place within our place? And there are a number of different frameworks that I've learned how to use from the Regenesis group, which is one of the, one of the mentors that I, I am deeply thankful for. They have truly contributed so much to my understanding of how to integrate whole systems. And like, if you're designing a building, we have four main systems to consider. Water, habitat, materials, and energy. Everything from there is how you knit a process together that can help you manage the balance of this. And out of this, clearly, a beautiful object should emerge. Or as Buckminster Fuller says, if at the end, if it's not beautiful, I know I have failed. Beauty entails ethics, entails proper water management, habitat, restoration, regeneration, clean materials, renewable materials, and producing energy from what we have available within our site. Ultimately, it's, I think, about building a new narrative, a new story of place. 
And how places conform gives a big part of their story. You see, every geological formation determines hydrological formation. Geology and hydrology dictate biology. These earth systems dictate human systems and ultimately human cosmologies. If we are in a downward spiral or hitting peak everything, we are in no need of framing this conversation as something sustainable. We need to frame it as something regenerative. We need to redesign the vehicle we are traveling in, not only make it less harmful. It's always about looking at potential. What can inspire even the most corrupt of politicians? What can make the most astringent community neighbor say, I go down for that, you know? And there's a big part of this. I've had more arguments because of the parking meters on the street than people taking the six lane highway from the center of the city. Because taking a six lane highway involves potential, involves water, involves public space, involves an integration of our own cycle. If we are just solving separate problems, we're just gonna drown in our problems and that's how we've been doing it. If we think about our highest potential, problems integrate into that vision of potential. Potential is very much tied with the roots of the place and how that place has evolved through time not only through its current state or current statistic data. We need to knit between what the place's essence is, both in its communities, biological and human. And what is this place called to be? What can this place accomplish? What role can we give our own place within our region, watershed or country? You see, the problems, the system of problems that we have is truly a system of problems that is beyond help individually. And everything will ultimately unravel through fruit security, as we have seen through the Arab Spring. But looking at this just needs to make us realize of integrating things in systems and helping people navigate through those systems. You see, more people die here of diabetes than the drug war. I maintain currently that Coca-Cola and Bimbo kill more people than, the, than Narcos. This is Mexico City's drainage. Estamos en el estado de Hidalgo, en una de las salidas del sistema de drenaje de la Ciudad de México y la zona metropolitana. Lo que estamos viendo son las descargas de aguas negras que provienen de esta zona urbana y que ilustra el manejo insostenible que estamos haciendo del agua en la ciudad. Es por ello que exigimos un manejo sostenible del agua que incluya la captura y uso de aguas pluviales, del agua de lluvia, el rescate y manejo de los ríos y el tratamiento de aguas residuales para su reuso en otro tipo de actividades. it's always an impact to see 22 million people's drainage. That drainage sh should be cleaned by this treatment plant. Have you seen $5 billion in an, un, in, in una, I say, una imagen inservible as a completely non-functional image or wasteful image? It's corrupt. 77% of treatment plants in Mexico are off and most have never even been turned on. This is great infrastructure. And the sad part is that this infrastructure is the current norm, the country and the planet over. No, que no pase. No, no, no. We are in La Región de Anáhuac, it's called. It's in or near the water. 
how we've been trying to solve our water problems is by bringing 30% of our water from adjacent watersheds, pumping them up from 1,600 meters to 2,700 meters, and mixing all our water with our drain, all our rainwater with our drainage, and pumping that through the river video you just saw to irrigate crops. I joke about this, but I don't know if you've seen this uh, jacket that says Mexico is the it's gotten very famous around uh, the fashion industry and a friend of a friend of mine sells it so i'm like i want him to make me one that says mexico eats sadly that's what happens the country over how we are planning to solve this is in the most stupid and corrupt way possible we are investing 50 million pesos in an investment that should have been or was budgeted at 10. Current NGOs working for construction and corruption, construction without corruption, estimate that 37% of construction budget is just lost in corrupt processes. We are having sinkholes in Mexico City and around that are incremental in size and in quantity year by year. Our watershed has been housing our own trash. And the leachates that drain from this trash have been contaminating the eastern part of our watershed. This dynamic goes the country over. We can go off to Rio Atoyac, where we have worked with local government, and learning that our mountains, our volcanoes, have been completely stripped out of their forests. This volcano is called Matlalcueyatl, which means feet with the green skirts. From the green skirts emerges the rivers. Rio Atoyac, which is the birth of Balsas River, is possibly our most important river. It's the birthplace of Cholula, the longest lived city in the Americas, and it's toxic, completely toxic. The river is feeding the aquifer instead of the other way around. So everybody in Puebla is drinking water with these contents, mercury, benzene, lead and arsenic and words that I don't even know what they mean. <coughs> this river is a drainage, 70% drainage, and it's infiltrating the aquifer, and that's where Puebla City and the metropolitan areas are taking their own water. We are seeing also that this is Cholula. It's the biggest pyramid in the world. Cholula, you know, the Incas made pilgrimages to Cholula. The Aztec never conquered Cholula. Cholula is the, or was the Calmecac. Calmecac in Nahuatl means the life school. It's where people learned mathematics, astrono astrology, poetry, ecology, and all of that. And if we go southern more to Chiapas, and we're one of a, a very important hydrological node in the Americas, Rio Grijalva and Usumacinta, and you see it in the vortex where four tectonic plates collide, and also four very, very important cultures in the history of Mesoamerica. You see, and this is the sad part, the country over, the watershed and the drainage system are the same map. Wherever there are drainage, we pump it to the rivers, and the rivers carry it to one of our most important natural sites. This is a mile-high canyon called El Cañón del Sumidero. It's truly beautiful and beautifully contaminated. The problems this generates for Rio Sabinal are constant year by year. And the sad part of all this is it's even contaminating the air we breathe. 42,000 people die of air quality in Mexico as a country. 9,600 of those are in the Mexico City metropolitan area. This is, again, more than any drug war. We are resigning ourselves out of extinction. Honestly, the Anthropocene and we're causing it's relative to the force of a meteorite. Here we can see all the water in the world, the fresh water in the world, 
and all the air we can breathe. We are a blue planet, but what we have accessible to us is really a very limited resource. And we know that gray infrastructure is not the way forward. Green infrastructure via constructed wetlands and other uh, like uh, bioswells and rain gardens and all of this green infrastructure integrated into city life is a fraction of the cost in its treatment, its operation, and the livability it provides to different areas. This is a school that natural systems designed the wetland, and this school has its park be its wetland, and its wetland it's also its school. <coughs> because you see, the best investment we can make is actually in life itself. Even Arup, the biggest engineering company in the world, agrees. We need to be chubby addressing green infrastructure in a very, very militant way. Because again, it's not a question of how we develop, or if, sorry, if we develop. It's a question of how we develop. It's a question of what micro project we establish across our watershed that are integrated to community life, business life, and local life. The Americas, roughly a little bit less than the photo you see on the screen, had 25 million people living here before Christopher Columbus. 98% of this population died in 40 years, uh, 80 years. A lot of due to viruses. But this, the important part in this story is that 25 million people lived there without Walmart and without the local importing of, tilap, of Chinese fish. We produced our own food. Mexico has the potential to change the world multiple times over. It has done so. It's, we could say it's the pattern. Mexico closed off, cha changing the tides in the planet, forcing uh, warm tides up towards the northern hemisphere and towards England, closing off the circulation between Atlantic and Pacific, and that started the ice ages four million years ago. A little bit further back in our deep time, we, we saw that in the Yucatan Peninsula, <coughs> the asteroid that killed off life and dinosaurs, dinosaur life, not all of life, thankfully, uh, happened also in Mexican territory. Through the Christopher Columbus, as Charles C. Mann calls it, the Columbus Exchange, we see how Mexico changed the world again, starting through uh, what he calls the start of globalization. Because you see, imagine Italian cuisine without tomatoes. Imagine Ireland without potatoes, Europe without tobacco. We see that we have, or the Swiss without chocolate. Charles C. Mann even goes out to point out that the introduction of corn was one of the main culprits in ending the last Chinese dynasty. The, the knowing, the understanding of our territory is probably our most important task. Natives used to do altars making a model of their watershed. Here we see a section of Mexico cutting from Puerto Vallarta to Veracruz. It's a very unique territory. A territory that is defined by the rivers or its veins. Rivers do not know political divisions or stupid walls. Life follows life. Humans interact in the same way that biology does because we are life, that we are exchanging cocaine, illegal traffic of guns and all of that is a question of intention. If we know how to flow with life, we will be able to create, again, a single continent integrated through its forests like it once was. Mexico is the highest biodiversity. It's in the top five hot, uh, mega diverse countries. We hold the number one in biodiversity of oaks, pines, and cactus. 
also of reptiles. We are one of the most biodiverse countries and hold important aspects of biodiversity. Oaks are one of our most important relationships. You see, without oaks, there would not have been La Niña, La Punta, y La Santa Maria, the oak boats that crossed over from Europe. Without oak, and the oak, um, ah, how you say, abellana? <coughs> acorn that is used by a wasp as a nest for, as a, as a birthing nest, the, the acorn's genetic structure is changed. And these acorns in all of their different mutations are what have provided the world with ink. This is one of the best aspects for me of learning the big impact that a tiny relationship between a wasp and the acorn can bring about to humanity. And without the oak, there would be no Cambridge, no Oxford, and I always like to say, and no Hogwarts. You see, Mexico is the birthplace of corn as well. It's the first genetic experiment in history, taking the Teosintle, which is a very small little corn, up towards the crossbreeding of different Teosintles, bringing about the big corn, which is a stable food for civilization. The corn does not go in and of itself. It's part of a system called la milpa. The milpa is seen as a 25 to 30 year cycle, providing with food, plants, wood, carbon, and oak. La región de Anagua, or the or our watershed, which is, means close or near to the water, was called the Venice of the Americas by the conquistadors. This uh, dear biologist friend of mine says it's one of the biggest ecocides the world has seen. We are in a very unique system. It's an endorheic basin. It's a watershed closed in on itself. I always joke around when I say, you know the saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> Ecosystemically, what happens in Mexico City stays in Mexico City, or should. Air, that is the reason we, we of our air pollution. Well, the main reason, obviously, are private cars. But the fact that we live in a bowl, watershed, is one of our most important aspects of our essence as a systemic Basin. We are situated in the neo-volcanic trans-Mexican axis. This is the only mountain range that crosses the continent east to the west. The Nahuas, the Nahuatls would call this the belly butt or the heart of the world. We are connected all the way to California. If California and the San Andreas Fault decide to, to widen and separate from the United States geologically, Mexico City would maybe have oceanfront. Our hydrological cycle is very much integrated in that we infiltrate water through our mountains because the lower part of the watershed is full of clay and ash, clay and ash, clay and ash. So it's a very <coughs> difficult to permeate ground. Our water infiltrates in our ravine and our creeks in our watershed, in the mainly western part of our watershed. Here we can also see how our lake system is divided with salt water on the east and fresh water on the west. This is a settlement pattern that comes about from Aztec times. How life settles through all of this is a truly unique biodiverse system native to spirulin, native to the axolotl, which is our most regenerative organism that we know of, and how the city has truly eaten away through this green space is a very dire scenario. You see, the rivers are born healthy. The problem is its contact with the urban fabric. And what we really dream of is a city that is healthy. And we believe a healthy city promotes health. 
and in regenerating living systems, creating biological corridors, it's the way that we can go about it. This is the Piedad River in the 1940s. I always say that it's good that we don't smell the picture because it's drainage. And we know how we can come about different examples the world over of cities coming back, bringing their rivers back, bringing river patterns back integrated into street patterns. And being able to give priority to a biological corridor that can help balance the city with water and park life. These are all the streams in the central part of the city. You see, this is 20 minutes away from, from where we are right now in the center part of the city. And it's really in our most uh, beneficial concern to bring about nature into the city, bringing bio, uh, bio, biosphere reserves within the city. We see on the image with the kid in blue running through a protected area in Oaxaca. And we see the girl running through a river within the city. As long as we can continue to thrive and do this integration of life and city, I think we stand a very big chance. The projects we have done up in the ravines are a small example of what can happen in small tactical urbanism settings where there's a little park that we can make a water park and start connecting public space to healthy water. It's a question of developing a new narrative, but of also within this narrative, looking at the beauty that these places can bring about. A new forest culture is part, integral part of bringing this back, not only through also public policy and have ecosystem payments for different uh, stewardships or midwives as we were calling early earlier today developing micro strategies with all new uh, housing of harvesting rainwater treating their own sewage producing electricity from that sewage producing different water and trash recycling abilities the ravines in the western part of the mountains have a very big potential. They are beautiful spaces that are, again, used as sewers right next to water spritus, or Josewa, to springs. These ravines are, a lot of them are invaded and inhibiting proper water flow. So we need to look for a different constellation of projects across our watershed, depending on where in the watershed we are, is the type of green infrastructure we would develop. Like this project, which is in the delta of two of the city's rivers in its main urban area. And we are in this loop from our salad to our, to our bathrooms, to our rivers, back to our salads. And how can we give about different micro interventions across the watershed? Generating public space also, because public space in Mexico is at a very, very, very low state. So multiple interventions across the city has ultimately brought about a very interesting life path for me. I mean, we've, we've toyed around with administrations for the last 10 years. Uh, right now, they're building an airport that has no consideration to the watershed and that has absolutely no idea how to connect to the city. And we have this little idea of saying, let's connect the train that goes towards Toluca towards the main airport. And for, for that investment, bringing back the river would be a minuscule part of it. It's between 5 and 10 percent of what the airport is building in terms of its infrastructure for more, more than one river, clearly. You see, we are investing in this great infrastructure, putting our rivers aside. Rio Magdalena, which is the, the city's most <coughs> troubled river, had a big intervention and is right now in a very dangerous state. 
we have developed this vicious, vicious cycle of looping rivers, turning them into drainage and highways, and that entail contaminates our air and goes back up into our forests. We know that cars are not the solution. We know that cars have, um, you see, 50% of trips in Mexico City are under seven kilometers. And an average speed of cars here is 11 kilometers an hour, something that you can easily beat with a bike. What we need to create here is a metropolitan agency, something that has happened the world over from Curitiba, Barcelona, LA. We need to take long-term city planning away from politicians. And the way we have tried to do this here is through picnics. But where we are right now is on top of the sewer of La Piedad River, which is this main artery, the aducto, that crosses the city east to west. Multiple iterations of different community groups have come together. We have even thought about an urban mall on top of a street labeled as a cultural center that they were promoting, but it was really a big mall. We are developing these social businesses that are within one system, but integrated and collaborating in a very open platform. Our second to last picnic, the politicians took us away and we even became trending topic. And ultimately we've been continue, continuing the fight replicating picnics, picnics across Mexican territory and even helping people in Costa Rica jumpstart their picnic in the Rio movement, which has been going on in a much steadier and organized pace than us. In the moment, we integrated art into the picnic, and I'm happy to say this is going to be the entrance to a wetland that is being constructed today. We are comparing river water with clean water and hoping to, again, with all different initiatives, bring about experiences that can help people understand and have a bodily experience of things that we have already learned for ourselves. We've done these videos. No turds were damaged in the making of this video. You see, this, this, this positive dynamic needs to be set about where living rivers can bring about city life and how city life can in turn be providing nutrients for the rivers. And the picnics is the way that we have taught people, kids, a lot of kids visit us, a lot of people visit us, and we're showing them their drainage and talking about our watershed. The NGO we have set up right now, aside from my design office, is Four to the Cube. Four to the Cube moves about at four different axes, water, mobility, public consumption, uh, responsible consumption and public space at four different levels, at the individual, the local, regional and community levels. And we call about for four actions to change, habits, budgets, infrastructures and law. We are seeing capability building as the core of our building blocks and how we move about in this new river, micro river park regeneration. And we are inviting people to participate through a website that we launched last week. What ideas do you have to better your own space? How can we help you integrate? This is a framework we designed that helps different NGOs locate their different um, orbits of action, you could say. What do we do? At, and we're building, in theory, a pyramid. 
block by block, stone by stone. What do we do at the four different axes, the four different levels, and the four different actions? Everything around understanding our watershed, the rivers within our watershed, how green infrastructure can be a big part of this, how if we invest in green infrastructure, it's much cheaper than what we invest yearly in just the maintenance of that gray infrastructure. Green infrastructure is being built in the city right now at a very small scale, but we have at the moment four projects, public projects that we know about that are happening, all done by close collaborators and members of Cuatro al Cubo. You see this cycle and bringing information, visual data to people is what's helping us change this conversation over. Changing from a lineal cycle to a circular cycle, developing tactical urbanism examples across the city. And you see, we invest 86% of our public budget in car infrastructure, where in reality, mobility is done the other way around, 80% in public transportation. We are mapping current states, current systems of mobility and looking out where we can join up with the systems that we need to be lobbying for, maybe including a regenerated river train towards the new airport, developing things like urban gardens and grow gardens. How we, what we are calling this park in the middle of the highway is called Ecoducto, which the logo tells us we're getting water from the drainage and pumping it up and treating it with a wetland, with life. The first plant we put in the picnic is still there alive and is going to be maintained throughout the new park. And we can see here the delta where one river meets the other river, right? You see Rio Tacubaya and Rio Becerra with different water water compositions and the park that is happening is basically going to get water from the sewer pump it up to the biodigesters and filter it through wetlands ultimately it'll get to a little stream that will be like a very tiny maquette or model of what the big river could ultimately be there's going to be a recreation area where at the end of this 1.6 kilometer park, people are going to be able to enjoy and get their feet wet with clean water. We are also uh, setting up and announcing next week that a public international competition is going to come about for a pavilion, the water pavilion, which is in the middle of this 1.6 kilometer walk in an a very busy intersection where we see a conversation area, a museum area, and another excuse to invite people to imagine what we can do together. This competition is going to be done by Arquine, which have done 20 competitions yearly. And the biggest, maybe more uh, obnoxious part of the process is going and sitting down with every politician saying, hey, how can we lobby for this and green infrastructure and water harvesting and all of these different things? We can also truly here accomplish if we are joined together. As much NGOs all working from their own niche, but also helping create and collaborate through Port to the Cube strategy so we can bring about citywide change. A big part of this is learning how to have conversations between ourselves, between politicians, <clears throat> like sitting around the fire like we used to. A big part of this is personal development and how you choose to ventilate frustrations like meditation, nature walks, camping, building your own shelter in the river. And a big part of my own transformation came about <laughs> after Burning Man when I had the chance to visit Berlin for the second time. And Berlin had gone a huge transformation since I visited in 1999 into, I mean, you could really say one of the biggest rebranding strategies the world has seen is Berlin. Going from a city focused on 
war to a city focused on creation, a city focused on art, a city that helped me realize and dedicate and ventilate a big part of my frustration, not only through art festivals and proposing water temples for Burning Man, but also in bringing about real projects like this car based on the axolotl, which is one of the most regenerative creatures that we know of, into Burning Man. The axolotl lives in this system, Xochimilco, which we could call the foundation of Mexico City. 50% of our aquifer, of the water for Mexico City, comes from Xochimilco aquifer, and sinkholes are appearing in Xochimilco. So if we're going to do art for a festival, let that art be a connection to something that inspires. Let that art spark a conversation, not only collaboration across walls, continents, and watersheds, but something that I believe is at the core of how we accomplish better cities together. It's about making things together. It's about collaborating. It's about dreaming and manifesting. This little car went to Burning Man for the second year and it sparked conversations. It's sparking conversation as we speak here in Mexico. I, I truly believe in the power of the conversation, of the fire breathing art car to help inspire people to do something about it. As James Baylog says in Chasing Ice, he's a photographer. That's what I know how to do, take pictures. What we know how to do is design and how even a party mode axolotl in Burning Man can help spark a regenerative conversation about Xochimilco, about Mexico City, about art as a change agent in the most surreal of landscapes. We did not burn it. We just made a <coughs> ceremonial burn in the office. We actually want to do a per pilgrimage with the axolotl throughout Mexico. This is the axolotl in, day, in year two. And the amount of work and people collaborating to bring things forward is truly amazing. What this has brought about is other conversations of doing an axolotl food truck that can talk about Xochimilco and serve food harvested in Xochimilco Chinampas is a big part of this. How we can also bring about a jewelry that we call it sacred reminders that we can carry with us and help uh, spark conversations wherever we are. We're talking about doing an axolotl kiosk so that it's an inform inf informative experience that can be an, in an uh, iterating or a traveling kiosk preaching the word of the axolotl. and multiple different exercises of just creating, just making something that can spark a positive conversation. Part of one of the things we've, I've most enjoyed is graffitiing the Zócalo, our main square plaza. We were invited to paint the rivers. <coughs> so it's these ongoing and constant efforts so that we can <clears throat> bring about, bring an experience to people so that they can see the health of their rivers. We collected 15,000 water bottles from across the watershed with this simple idea in mind. Water is born healthy. We did this 15,000 times with Greenpeace and we want to bring about again, an idea that can help inspire by learning, that we can see clean water in the upper watershed, dirty water in the lower watershed. If we are part of the problem, we are part of the solution. This was a seven by seven topographical, hydrological, and it's what leads the conversation and where it leads. Ultimately, people we set that up with, Arquine, and uh, because of the dual year we have with Germany, we went and did another sculpture that talks in a very simpler way 
they did not let me take Mexico City water to Berlin, so we painted that water in remembrance of the last lost lake and contaminated lake we have right now. This constant exploration and watershed just mimics what people used to do back in the day. We do not, we, people used to take an altar to Popocatépetl volcano or hold them within their own houses. Anthropologists tell us that some of these altars were so detailed that they even had birds. This constant watershed exploration <coughs> is both artistic for me and it helps paint a way for something to do while we get the community and the politicians in line. Very close to all of this is the possibility of art as a change agent, right? And this, this image by John Quigley, you can see the scale of this, it's, it's huge helped unite farmers in Nebraska with Neil Young and Willie Nelson and provoking a concert and an image that was used across multiple different mediums, helping the Obama administration cancel the Keystone Pipeline. Art can change the world. If we orbit around water as our most sacred and important relationship, even in the rebranding, you see, in Mexico, we say agua. Aguas is like an emergency. Let's imagine you're driving with someone and you're about to crash and you yell, water, water. And this is a very deep ingrained in the mindset that water is a problem. Water is an emergency. So we hold a constant podcast where we talk with different people that are working in water, where we try to rebrand the word water. Rivers should have their own rights of personhood like New Zealand, and now India. This is something for To The Cube is looking for as we speak. Multiple different startups could emerge from energy to water monitoring, buying local food, because a lot of questions I get through these multiple interactions and experiences is how can I have an impact? I am not a designer, I am not a lobbyist or politician. Our most impactful thing we can have is our food, where we buy it, how much of it is animal based. It's really our most continual daily activity. It's our most important thing to change in the very short to immediate term. And ultimately, I believe the big aspect of things, it's about ecological literacy, as Fridjof Capra says. Schumacher College has been crucial in my development and I deeply invite people to participate in a learning transformational experience like Schumacher can provide. Ultimately, it is about integrating complex systems. So we need frameworks and understanding and to develop the capabilities within ourselves to do this. It's very complicated and long-term to build a pyramid of agreements between people. And this is what we are up against. This is where we are up, up for. This is probably my favorite quote of the year. We need to shift from apocalyptic to utopian, inviting people to imagine and dream with all of them. From crazy dreams of parachuting and diving bears within the city, or integrating one of the most biodiverse hotspots in the world. This is El Triunfo watershed, a biosphere reserve in Chiapas, photoshopped with, within the city. It's a very quick example that I did with the iPad. It's just a question of exploring and presenting options. It's a question of participating. This is our newly launched website, Por Cuatro al Cubo, where we are inviting people to upload their own ideas, rep or if they want to help individually, they want to register their own group. And this is, will also serve as register for database for the ongoing picnics. We want to tame, make a place change itself. How do we do that is a question of the process and how we are developing and integrating within each different place to do so. We believe that four to the cube, cuatro al cubo is a perfect platform to 
plant the seeds of this transformation. We are a single island. A single island. This is the first plant that we put about in the picnic. That is where the wetland is going to be. And this is what we are inviting people to participate with us. And uh, thank you very much for listening. So, uh, does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Um, so, is, is this project moving forward and are they making progress politically in Mexico City? Is it coming to, is it going to happen? <laughs> it, it's happening. It's a big uh, effort from the architecture perspective because it's like, uh, it's not our design. It's not my design. It's a biologist's design and a construction design and the, the local government design, right? So it, it's a question of, of insisting on the right concepts, but letting go of the outcome. It's, a, it's been a very, very interesting exploration because we see there is life there, you know? There, there are river rocks that are put on top of the tubes that were once, we believe, under the tubes, right? The warrior plant, the first plant we put in the picnic. It's in theory going to be finished by the end of October. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Question? Yeah, so you guys, are you guys actually like making a change? Like are you guys actually like causing like some way to help out the environment over there, like the joy and all that? So here in Mexico City. In Mexico City. So yeah. Alex, did you hear that? I, I I missed a couple of parts of it. Could you repeat it please? So what changes are you making environmentally there in Mexico City with your work? What changed? Did you see happening right now? It's just this pilot program. It's just this like tiny 1.6 kilometer wetland on top of eight, eight meters wide by 1.6 kilometer wetland and up in park. Uh, that's the big accomplishment to date. Uh, we are lobbying for the uh, public competition pavilion that will house all of that. A, a year and a half long watershed education campaign that's going to be a part of this project. Those are the big aspects of it. And uh, we are supporting different people that are working on different things that tie into this, like water harvesting and rain gardens in other parts of the watershed. It's not only about the wetland and about our river, a little bit of the money that we're, because we're designing the infographics for the, for the museum. A group of biologists is uh, doing the, the wetland design. So what we've established sort of like the NGO parameter is that we're gonna keep, or we're basically overcharging as an NGO 18% of what different jobs we get for the people within the NGO. And that 18% we're deciding we're going to spend mostly in lobbying and in generating, well, for, for, we're, we're going to pay for the rights of personhood campaign, legal campaign for Rio Magdalena. But that's going to start at this, this next month. And we're also going to invest in new renderings and virtual reality experiences to help people understand and widen this. We're in a very important time in Mexico politics where the, the next administration comes, comes in next year. So it, it, we believe it's a very important time to 
to keep moving and I'm pushing forward and trying to get things like water harvesting as law and water treatment and green infrastructure as law within you're going to build a public space part of it needs to be green infrastructure so there's a couple of a number of things that we're lobbying for within the whole for to the cube strategy so um I'm from Horizonte, and we're trying to like, we're trying to do kind of like the same thing. We're trying to make a change in our Jordan River because I don't know if you've seen the river like from what it used to be back in the day. People used to say that they, they would be able to see like it was clear. And for my school, we're trying to like, we're trying to figure out a way how we can help that river. And you know, like it would be great if you guys could like help us too because like since you guys know more about this stuff, I think it would, with your information and ours like mixed together, I think we can actually like change the way it works now from like. Like, we want to change it back to what it was before, because now if, if you walk the trail and you look at our river, the river's just green from all the algae that's grown inside of it and from all the all the trash that people throw in there. And we're just trying to like fix that so that so that you can make little little impacts in the environment again so that everything can be the way it was before you you know what I mean? Yeah, I think connecting with Brian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, because then that opens up uh, you know the the reach of who you have available to ask questions of or uh, to also find out success stories that others have had or, you know, and, and definitely I think even Alex like, would be willing to like, give feedback of ways to help out, you know. Yeah, Natalie, Natalie and I are, are planning some, some uh, activities for, for y'all um, and we're going we're gonna to get outside and, and explore these environments and, and do uh, create some positive change. Elias, thank you. Thank you so Thanks much, so Elias. Thank you. Hope to meet you all soon in person. We can go swimming to a Mexico City river, but a nice one.